Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from, without getting too bogged down in music theory. Up first this week for our two games is 2009's Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, the award-winning cinematic success for Naughty Dog that finally gave PlayStation 3 its killer app, three years into the console's life. Following that is a return to the career of fulfilling dreams for those who are dying, with a meaningful message about seeing the good in what you have instead of what you could have had, 2017's Finding Paradise. You could argue that Finding Paradise is also the point of Uncharted 2, and how they are looking for Shambhala, or Shangri-La as it is known, so there is paradise that needs to be found in both games, I suppose. Otherwise, they are hardly anything alike, so it's a little <laughs> bit of a stretch. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, I'm fine with that, that theming. It's the name of one game and the theme of the other game, perfect. Bang. So, <laughs> I guess that'll have to work. Joe, how are you doing this week? What are you playing? I spent pretty much the whole week playing two games, neither of them being Great Ace Attorney. Uh, I need to get back to it, I just haven't in the past few nights. Uh, but I've been playing Sable a lot, which is basically, what if Breath of the Wild didn't have any combat, and also it took place on Tatooine with hover bikes. It does look like a cool game, for sure. It's pretty neat. Super buggy. Hmm. Like, wow, there's a lot of jank. Uh, nothing that has made it an unenjoyable experience, but, like, sometimes you'll, like, go up a dune and your bike will be like, oh, I need to go straight now, and then it'll tip up on its nose and you'll just spin in place for a few seconds, which is really fun. And I've had more than a few moments where it's like, oh, this object didn't have collision. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but overall, I think it's pretty good. I think it's it's really good. It's got a neat soundtrack, like a neat low-key soundtrack. Uh, and then I've also been playing a lot of Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Because it came out on Switch, and I reviewed the Switch version. Hmm. It's still Kakarot. It's still aggressively fine. Okay. I was going to say, like, didn't that come out? Oh, right, right. Switch version. Yeah, that yep. makes sense. Kind of pleasantly surprised at how well it runs on the Switch, considering it already didn't run super great on the PlayStation 4. Well, when you decrease resolution things, I'm sure things are possible. Uh, <laughs> I am playing Great Ace Attorney Chronicles as well. Didn't make much progress, but I cleared Case 2-2. So I am, yeah, in the Resolve game, as I mentioned last time, but I did beat that one that was like, oh yeah, didn't you remember that this happened in the timeline of the first <laughs> game? And Mr. Sholmes said, oh, that thing we found, we can't talk about this case ever. You can't write about it. So uh, that's kind of where we are. A few more cases left, and I guess we're finally getting to that big old celebration fair. Yeah, you're slowly catching up to me. Slowly but surely, <laughs> but that's really about it. Let's talk about some composer follow-up news, though. We've talked about many composers on this show, and they are still doing great things, working on many things in the industry, in other industries. Uh, the big thing we have to talk about as far as video game news, though, is the Nintendo Direct that happened last week as of time of recording, and uh, some big things happened in there. Kind of early on in the Direct, uh, we heard a little bit about this game. We think we even talked about it on our composer follow-up news segment, but... We finally got a first look, and a, even a demo look, at Voice of Cards, The Isle Dragon Roars. And that is the new game from Yoko Taro, and Keiichi Okabe is on the soundtrack. So, the Nier Automata team doing a tabletop card role-playing game for Square Enix. That's, it looks kind of interesting. The final Super Smash Bros. Direct, the final Mr. Sakurai Presents, so help him, the man needs his rest, <laughs> is coming on October 5th, so the release date of the next episode, essentially. Maybe we'll give our predictions finally before 
uh, you know, who will the last character be on the next episode. Also, Nintendo 64 games and Sega Genesis games are coming to the Nintendo Switch Online Expansion Pass in October. Pay a premium for your account. Get access to more games. How expensive will that be? Nintendo doesn't want to say yet. Very suspicious that no mention of any price point happened at any point. So help me if the single user price goes up from like 20 to 50 a year. Oh, jeez. But that would be a Nintendo thing to do, wouldn't it? But uh, Super Mario 64 is on that kind of base list. They're planning on expanding and adding like Majora's Mask, Pokemon Snap. Uh, Banjo-Kazooie, which is an interesting get. As long as Microsoft has the nice polished one through Rare Replay, they're like, okay, I guess we can give you the original version Nintendo. And then for Sega Genesis, I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Gunstar Heroes, there's some pretty good games on that list. I think both of us cackled and died seeing that there is an Act Razor remaster in the form of Act Razor Renaissance, and it's out now on Nintendo Switch and PlayStation platforms, and even has a remastered soundtrack. So, so that's something. I've been talking to a uh, Neil Ronahan over at uh, NWR a little bit about it because he did buy it immediately, and he's the the other Act Razor fan that exists, and. <laughs> I kind of agree with them that like, oh man, it's visually super ugly. I know I don't like how it looks, but it's apparently still very fun to play and the remastered soundtrack sounds absolutely incredible. Yuzo Koshiro still came on to do it. So yeah, I'm going to buy it eventually and I'm going to play it. Hearing Fillmore redone was just incredible. And of course, this was the Nintendo Direct that ended with you know, Splatoon 3 and Bayonetta 3, so we get, you know, sequels officially. I mean, we knew about Splatoon 3 for a while, but Bayonetta 3, I mean, first time in almost four years. I actually finally got a trailer. Got to see Bayonetta's look, so more great music coming from those franchises. And the, the big moment from the Direct was Shigeru Miyamoto coming on the screen to talk about the casting for the Mario movie. It has nothing to do with composers, but boy, that's the moment that everyone's talking about from the Direct. What a list of people. Chris Pratt is Mario. Chris okay. Pratt is Mario sounds like something Donkey would put into a video as a joke. <laughs> Seeing his reaction was a good time. Let's just put it that way. So pretty okay direct as a whole. I had a good time watching it. Yeah, it, I think it was uh, super great. I liked listening to Castle Super Beast. Uh, Wooly, Madden, and, and Pat Bavon's podcast the day after because they record on Mondays, so they had already recorded the show, and in that show, they both mentioned Winback. They mentioned Winback at some point, which mm -hmm. is an N64 game I've never heard of that is coming to the Nintendo Switch Online service, and then they also talked about how Bayo 3 doesn't exist, basically. And to think that two days later, it was like, yeah, here's both of these things. <laughs> it was really funny. That is uh, quite fortuitous. Let's put it that way. Good direct overall, but I think we'll be waiting for the Smash one to see what your uh, Smash pieces fate will be. Finally, the last spreadsheet cell will be filled. <laughs> Bothers me so much every day. And for the last piece of uh, Composer follow-up news, we also have some news that Laura Shigihara actually contributed to a track in Deltarune Chapter 2. I still haven't played it. I, I went ahead and installed it on PC. We'll see if I end up playing it at some point, but uh, always happy to hear some Laura Shigihara. We're going to talk about Laura Shigihara a little bit today, and maybe even after the game that comes out this week. Mm hmm. So yeah, it won't be the last time we talk about her. Let's get started with our first game this week, and it is Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. This was certainly one of the games that, for a while, we thought, oh, maybe we'll never get to this one. It's, it's one main composer on the soundtrack, and then found a, a weird loophole, I suppose, with another composer credited on this soundtrack. So, let's get into it. We've talked about the Uncharted series before on this show. We talked about Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception in episode 29, and Uncharted 4, A Thief's End in episode 73. And here we are in 140. So 
it was due to talk about another Uncharted game, I think, at least from my perspective. So Uncharted 2 Among Thieves released in North America on PlayStation 3 on October 13th, 2009. Australia got the game on the 15th and Europe got it on the 16th. Then it was remastered as part of the Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection game, which released on PS4 in October 2015. So honestly, that's the best place to play Uncharted 2 today is through the Nathan Drake Collection. The game is developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony Computer Entertainment. It is a third-person action-adventure platform game, primarily with third-person shooter combat elements. The gameplay is sort of a hodgepodge of these few gameplay styles with third-person shooting. You also have some platforming, climbing, and light puzzle solving. It's an Uncharted. That's basically what it is. It's uh, nothing too out of the ordinary for the original game that it had set up with Uncharted, Drake's Fortune in 2007. It kind of did more of the same with a few slight improvements and tweaks. So, the plot of the game involves two years passing after the events of the first game, where treasure hunter Nathan Drake is approached by former associate Harry Flynn and Flynn's girlfriend Chloe Frazier to help steal a Mongolian oil lamp connected to Marco Polo's doomed 1292 voyage from China. Unbeknownst to Flynn, Chloe and Nate had worked together before, and Chloe plans on blackmailing Flynn and escaping with Nate and whatever treasure they find. The group steals the lamp, and its flammable resin reveals that Polo's fleet was shipwrecked in Borneo, and was carrying the Chintamani Stone from the fabled city of Shambhala. After Flynn double-crosses Nate, leaving him to be arrested, Chloe helps free Nate with his longtime friend Victor Sullivan. She reveals that Flynn is working for Zoran Lazarevich, a Serbian war criminal who is seeking the stone. Can Nate stop Lazarevich from discovering Shambhala? What secret is the Chintamani stone hiding? And what happens when Nate's ex-girlfriend and journalist Elena Fisher comes back into the picture, as she is also tracking Lazarevich? So, Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Uncharted 2 Among Thieves? So we've talked about Uncharted in the past, like you said, uh, at which point it has come out a couple of times. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Uncharted. I don't, I don't know why. This is the only one I have played all the way through. Okay. But it was a really long time ago. Like, this would have been like 2013, maybe 2012. And uh, I don't remember a lot about it. I do remember all the resin stuff because mm -hmm. I remember the cool, the cool like blue stuff. If that makes sense, it does. Am I remembering correctly? Okay, good. Uh, that's really all I remember. I can picture all these characters in my head, and I remember the final boss because I remember hating the final boss. Oh, it's a rough one. <laughs> it's it's not great, uh, <laughs> but. Yeah, I, I don't remember a lot more about it. Also, that's this is the one with the train, right? Oh, yeah. I remember the train scene, too. That that sequence is also is very good. I will I will give it that. So, yeah, it's this is the only one I've played. That's basically what it comes down to. You know, if there's any game that you should play, or at least to get a gist of what Uncharted is, I think 2 is a good one. If you don't like Uncharted 2, then, yeah, the series may not be for you, because uh, that's a pretty... Baseline indicator of quality for the series, I think. Yeah, the train scene is famous. Uh, the one you know, during the middle of the game where you got to move from cart to cart. And it was interesting to play Hitman 3 this year. And it's like, oh, oh, that's a moving train level. It's interesting how we've come in 12 years. So uh, interesting to note that. But yeah, I love the Uncharted series. I think Uncharted 2 was then the... Second game I played on, or no, maybe my third. Like, on when I got my PlayStation 3, I got L.A. Noir and I got Uncharted 1 and 2. So I think I've actually played L.A. Noir first because I was really itching to play that one. But I'm like, I've, I've been hearing good things about this Uncharted series. And so in 2011, got to play those first two games. And yeah, 2 is markedly better than 1. And then it's up for debate if you think 3 is better than 2. Uh, so that's how that kind of trilogy goes on PS3. But... Yeah, wow, a, a classic game, a 
very critically acclaimed game that really kind of put Naughty Dog on like, oh yeah, they're a good developer, but then like that put them into the stratosphere as, you know, putting them on that track to be one of the top developers in the game industry. Because they'd been on top before with like back when they were making Crash, Mm -hmm. but I feel like Jack and Daxter never quite hit the same level that Crash did. Right. It was like, oh yeah, Naughty Dog, that's a good game company too. Like, oh, Naughty Dog. (laughs) I think that was really the turning point there. Oddly enough, though, Uncharted 2 was only in development for 22 months, with six of those spent in pre-production. Granted, they had spent a lot of that time kind of building the foundation with the original Uncharted, and yeah, that released in 2007, but less than two years to work on the sequel? Uh, That's really impressive. And it was a much bigger sequel, too. Uncharted 2 has 564 in-game cinematic animations in comparison to 80 in the original Uncharted game. The game was intended to max out the PlayStation 3 cell processor's synergistic processor units, whereas the original Uncharted only hit about 30%. It stuffed the Blu-ray disc full of content. It was an updated Naughty Dog engine. It had better motion capture technology in addition to you know some of the jungle environments from the first game, which was, let's be honest, a lot of the first game, Uncharted 2 added concrete urban environments as well as snow environments. The game was first revealed by Game Informer in 2008, and I still think to this day Uncharted 2 has one of the best opening tutorial levels in games. Nate wakes up on a train... He's got a bloody stomach, which is not a good thing. That's a lot of his blood. And oh, he is sitting in this train that is hanging off a cliff. And so it begins in media res in the middle of the story. And you get to kind of learn the climbing basics as you get up that train and then kind of the fundamentals of operating an Uncharted game. It's it's a great Great, exciting opening level. Uh, So much to the point where it made such an impact on me that I wrote a paper on it at my time during grad school. It was kind of like an experiment where I was trying to get people to play that opening level and kind of study the choices that they would make and like how they would go about tackling that train and how to learn how to... Interesting. I think it's, it's just fascinating. One of my favorite sequences in early parts of a video game. I've thought about doing that with a couple of games throughout my life with, like, family members. I think the one I came closest to doing it with was just Journey as a whole. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've never ended up doing that. That sounds like it was that, like, it would be fascinating. Oh, yeah. I think I got a high A or an A plus on the paper. I did really well with it. So that's that's a good thing. But uh, I think if you're trying to do that, you got to find a sequence that is heavily scripted, heavily directed, not totally linear, but I don't know if journey would have worked so well as like, it's, it's so open-ended. That's true. Like you can literally do anything you want in journey as far as experiencing that adventure, but at least with uncharted, like you're kind of on this kind of corridor of like the path to get up the train, but then sometimes people may try different things and it doesn't work. So I, Just if anyone's thinking about doing some sort of study like that. One of the inspirations for the Tibetan village sequence that kind of takes place in the back third of the game was the 2000 video game The Graveyard by Tale of Tales. It was one of those games where it's like, I feel like I should know what that is. And then I kind of looked at it. It's like, oh, oh, that seems kind of familiar. It was like a black and white kind of, uh, you know, long walking simulator, if you will. Uh, but kind of like a basic indie one where you're just kind of walking down this hallway and you're having different things to interact with. So that was interesting to kind of rediscover. And this game introduced the multiplayer component of Uncharted, which had its audience for sure. Um, I know I didn't play the Uncharted games for the multiplayer, but many people did. In the first year of the game's launch, more than 125 million matches and 10,500 man-years had been played online, so... Hmm. And that's without a Subway uh, advertising agreement. 
exactly like they do with uh, the sequel, as we talked about in Uncharted 3 with that episode. So yeah, it had its audience there for sure, but uh, I've never played Uncharted multiplayer, that's, that's for sure. Uncharted 2 Among Thieves is one of the best reviewed games of all time, with a Metacritic average of 96. It is praised for its elaborate set pieces, character design, storytelling, graphics, technical innovation, and gameplay mechanics. Some criticisms include some finicky controls, as well as some odd platforming jumps. Like you think you're trying to jump one way and the jump should connect, and then it doesn't. It happens very rarely, but it certainly can break the cinematic flow that Naughty Dog is trying to craft with the game. As of March 2015, Uncharted 2 has sold 6.5 million copies. Then if you factor the Nathan Drake collection on PS4, that sold at least 5 million, and then plus more on top of that when it was included as a PlayStation Plus game in January of 2020, as well as part of the free Play at Home initiative in April 2020, where they gave that game to any PlayStation account owner, regardless of plus you know, status, if you wanted to add that to your collection or not. So many people out there with the opportunity to play Uncharted 2. It was an awards darling in 2009. It was nominated for 10 BAFTAs, and it won for story, action, use of audio, and original score. It was nominated for 15 Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Awards, what we now know today as the Dice Awards, and it won 10 of them, including Game of the Year and Outstanding Achievement in Original Music Composition. It was nominated for eight awards at the Spike Video Game Awards, winning Game of the Year, Best PS3 Game, and Best Graphics. Honestly, in a year of 2009 where the other big contenders were Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Batman Arkham Asylum, and Assassin's Creed 2, generally Uncharted 2 is widely considered the best game of 2009. As far as the game's legacy, Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception would be its sequel on PlayStation 3 in 2011, and then Uncharted 4 in 2016 on PS4. There is that Uncharted movie that stars Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg. Allegedly. Allegedly, <laughs> saying that it's currently scheduled for February 2022. I feel like since the last time we've talked about Uncharted, we've seen now some set photos and some stills from the movie, but haven't seen a trailer yet. So who knows? And then as far as the video game rumor mill goes, there's always talk that, oh, Sony San Diego is supposedly hiring for another project in addition to their work on MLB The Show, and uh, could it possibly be a new Uncharted project? Since Naughty Dog is certainly plenty busy enough, uh, there's always possibilities for the future of Uncharted. That just may not necessarily be with uh, Nathan Drake there. I mean, it's kind of surprising that more Uncharted got made after 3. Right. Uh, and that it wasn't a kart racer. Uh <laughs> Naughty Dog has a uh, a tendency to put out three games in a franchise and uh, then just move on to the next thing. So getting a fourth one was very, well, technically getting two more because of Lost Legacy. And I guess there was a Vita one, wasn't there? Yeah, it was Golden Abyss, which is a launch title on Vita. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, it's, it's certainly interesting to think about that franchise and, and what Naughty Dog does and what the future of it could be. I'd buy an Uncharted kart racer, by the way, just putting that out there. Oh, sure. If that's the multiplayer they want to uh, <laughs> include for whatever next game, I'm, I'm down with that for sure. Yeah, so the composer that we'll talk about this week is named Carmen Rizzo. And he was born on April 8th, 1964 in Akron, Ohio. And he was based out of Los Angeles for most of his career. Carmen Rizzo is an American record producer, mixer, programmer, DJ, remixer, and recording artist. He really does it all. How did he get into the industry? He says, quote, I was a drummer in bands as a kid, but I wanted to be a pro baseball player. It never happened, so I moved to L.A. at the age of 19 with $1,000 and did not know anyone. 
started off as a runner at Westlake Studios in 1984, and learned the ropes of what engineers and producers could do. He is a two-time Grammy nominee. He's worked with Seal, Coldplay, Paul Oakenfold, Alanis Morissette, Dido, Jem, Niaz, Ryuichi Sakamoto, which I feel like that name has come up a few times as far as Japanese influences on this show, Khaled, Tiesto, BT, Estero, A.R. Rahman, and Pete Townsend. He is a member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. He's served on the Board of Governors and Trustees for the Grammys, as well as on the Producer and Engineering Advisory Board. Apparently, in these roles, he is partly responsible for introducing the category of Best Electronic Album. And he's also hosted his own TEDx talk. Currently, he runs his own music label, Electrophone Music, uh, Electro-F-O-N-E. And currently, he is in Europe, working on many musical projects there. You can find him on Twitter, at Carmen Rizzo. So... Uncharted 2, A Thief's End, seems to be the only game that he's contributed music to. And we'll note how uh, he's done so. But looking up different sources for like old interviews and things like that, uh, there was an old GDC interview from 2009 with Gerard Marino and Carmen Rizzo. Gerard Marino, we've covered on the show for his work on the original God of War from 2005. And... They were talking about, they had like a 20-minute panel on their collaboration on how they were working for an upcoming MMO from Sony Online. There doesn't seem to be much mention on what that is, and Carmen Rizzo doesn't seem to be attached to any game project like that as far as when it came out. Based on Gerard Marino's discography and games that Sony Online worked out, might presume that this is 2011's DC Universe Online. But, yeah, again, Carmen Rizzo not seemingly attached to that project, so maybe he left at some point during that. Uh, Carmen Rizzo's music has appeared in CSI Miami and True Blood, as far as TV shows go. And in addition to scoring films for directors Michael Apted and Stanley Brooks, he composed the score for the 2014 film Perfect Sisters, which starred Abigail Breslin and Mira Sorvino. He has three solo albums, including Lost Art of the Idle Moment in 2005, Ornament of an Imposter in 2008, and 2010's Looking Through Leaves. Carmen Rizzo was somehow recruited to write, compose, perform what ended up being the ending credits theme for Uncharted 2. I wish I could find any source of like how that happened. How did they pick him. Maybe it was through work with Sony Online that there was some sort of collaboration. That would be my best guess since, you know, the Sony music team was kind of all involved there. Uh, but ultimately Uncharted 2 would have an orchestra made up of about 80 people and they would record at Skywalker Sound, the Lucasfilm property in Marin County, California. So, Unfortunately, that seemed to be really the only information I could glean. There was a video that seemed to be a panel about uh, something about you know, a night with the Uncharted 2 music team. And the clips they pulled from that weren't the most informative. I wish there was a full version of that panel online. That'd probably be really interesting. But it was more talking about like their work collaborating with Sony and all the efforts there. Uh, but... Not too much info there, unfortunately. So, with that being said, let's get to the Critical 5 tracks for Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. And we have to start with this one. We've got to, right? This is Nate's Theme 2.0. So you hear this theme and everyone who knows video game music is like, yep, this is the Uncharted theme. I mean, it, it might as well be, right? This is the theme that the franchise is really known by, but in the game, it's actually the title screen theme. It might as well be, you know, Nate's leitmotif if it's Nate's theme. But 
yeah, well, the original version is like a slightly lower pitch. And then we've covered Nate's theme 3.0 on the show before on Uncharted 3. Uh, and that's mostly the same, but just a few more instruments. I feel like this is the one that like when people are pulling a version of this theme, it's it's this one from Uncharted 2. Just a great classic piece, a very triumphant fanfare. At the end of the clip, you hear it kind of goes into the slow lull and then eventually will build back up to the orchestral swell. Just a piece that kind of exemplifies, I think, kind of the best of game title music, especially in this generation of games. Yeah, this is my favorite version of Nate's theme. I like the version from 3, but this one, I don't know. I feel like the added instruments in 3.0 aren't as productive. That's probably not the word I'm thinking of, but like I I like this version the best. And I agree, it's it's one of the top tier like title screen songs in in video games in general. Yeah, it's a classic one. Uh, there were some mixed feelings about do I add this one, even though we've talked about three point I'm like, no, this is the one from this game that best represents the franchise. It's, it had to be here for sure. But to continue on, we get to the next track on the Critical Five for Uncharted Two, and this one is Marco Polo. Nothing here about fish out of water or really good in-game jokes about Nate being in water and getting a trophy for Marco Polo. Ah, good times, good times with the Uncharted series. But this is like the Marco Polo theme. It's the leitmotif that echoes the perils of his crew and the journey that he went on. Uh, This is the music that plays at the beginning of the game. When you see the quote from Marco Polo of, I did not tell half of what I saw, for I knew I would not be believed. And oh, what is that instrument there? That is an Erhu, an E-R-H-U, masterfully played by Karen Hahn. And it's definitely something that echoes this sense of like these far east countries, this Tibet area, a beautiful sound, a beautiful instrument. And uh, not only does it stand out as a melody that is really kind of symbolic in this game, but it's, it's a total shift from the triumphant fanfare of Nate's theme. And it's kind of, I think, tapping into like the mysticism, the different far off land nature. But uh, there's there's a mystery here, especially as the piece builds beyond the clip. I always love when a song teaches me about a new instrument. I don't know what an air who is. But it sounds cool. And yeah, I think this this really fits the sort of mystical atmosphere around Shambhala and all of that. Every time I hear the name of Tibet, though, I am filled with the overwhelming urge to say, yes, the country, the independent country, Tibet. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Got that out of my system. Yeah, this song sounds really cool. And like I said, it's always great to learn about an instrument I was not previously aware of yeah it is an instrument that is just short of a meter long and it is a bowed two-stringed chinese vertical fiddle asia just has so many instruments that you just never see out here and they sound amazing and it's just uh it's a real nice touch for this game it won't be the last time we hear an airhu on this soundtrack in the critical five but we have to get to some prime Uncharted combat music and one of the better tracks I think in the whole franchise is here from Uncharted 2 this one number three on the critical five is Bustin Chops
Of course, how did I not mention before? If you want to know more about the main composer, Greg Edmondson, how did I not mention his name yet? That's a failure on my part. I apologize. Do check out our Uncharted 3 episode. That's where we kind of gave a breakdown of his work. And man, this is this is just Uncharted music to a T, especially when you're in combat, gunfire, running and gunning, or, you know, camping out in cover and just trying to pick people off. You know, this kind of exciting pace and, you know, big, deep brass hits and bam, 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 bam. Like, that's really, I think, the feel of Uncharted music and Edmondson nails that perfectly with this one. Not only a great title, but just one you hear and it's like, oh yeah, I, I can visualize this perfectly and the kind of mood in game. It feels like it's also trying to capture the same sort of attitude of like late era PS2 3D platformer boss. Mm, sure. Like, does does that make sense? I could see. I mean, your experience with Sly Cooper, I could kind of see that happen. Yeah. I don't know. Something about it just gives that gives off that vibe. I really like the brass in this song. Uh, it's it's very present. <laughs> mm-hmm. Punchy as well. Punchy, much like a certain Nathan Drake and the <laughs> full cemetery of humans that he's filled in this game. Let's let's not talk about that Ludo narrative <laughs> dissonance there though. <laughs> no, that's it's a lot of combat in the Uncharted games, but you know when it's this music or this this kind of music under it, uh, it's definitely memorable. I get to make that joke one time per Uncharted episode. I think that's fair, and then I get to always mention that the enemies are just a slog of bullets. Anyway, <laughs> they really needed to tone that down. What the heck? All right, number four in the Critical Five. I think this is the standout piece in the whole soundtrack, and it's one that a lot of fans remember. This is Reunion. So you're going through this game and Naughty Dog is just you know, pulling no punches as far as like setting standards on how to blend action and gameplay with these cinematic moments and tell a Hollywood-like movie story along the way. And then you get to this moment in Tibet where you meet this character who is trying to warn you of the dangers of what lies in Shambhala because he had an expedition there before, and it did not go well for uh, his comrades there. And uh, yeah, it, it does not go well for him as well in the story. So uh, this scene kind of punctuates uh, the reunion and farewell, shall we say, uh, of that character. And it's it's a big musical moment, and you hear at the end of this clip, the air who coming back in is just remarkable. It shows like the grand difference between the beautiful Hollywood orchestral swell and how gorgeous that can be to just the artistry of the solo air who and capturing the environment and the feel and the somber nature of this scene. Uh, it's a great, great piece and one that a lot of people, you know, if you're picking out top tracks from Uncharted 2, this has to be here. But I feel like you've had to have played the game to really fully appreciate the context of this one. Also, the air who sounds so cool in this song, though. I thought it was vocals for a second. Mm -hmm. It does kind of have a vocal like quality to it. Yeah. Yeah. It almost feels like it's like it's somebody singing. And that's really neat to know that that comes from a from a string instrument. Man, I need to look into air who stuff now. <laughs> Yeah, once again, kudos to Karen Han. Just gorgeous, gorgeous work here. We'll wrap up the Critical Five with Carmen Rizzo's work. This here is The Road to Shambhala.
what? It sounds totally different because it's the work of a different composer altogether? No way. Gasp. So yes, Carmen Rizzo worked on this one. It is the end credits theme. I don't know if it even necessarily fits, you know, an end credits mood for this game. It certainly stands out as different, but you know what? Sony Music reached out and they wanted uh, someone that they were working with at the time. That's my guess as to what happened. I would be very interested to learning, but that doesn't seem to be documented all that well. But yes, this is definitely Carmen Rizzo's style more with the electronic sound and trying to bring in different instruments here. You kind of hear the uh, electric guitar kind of mixed in here, but it's a nice full soundscape and it's totally different compared to the orchestration in the air who and but it's it's the wrapping up of the journey uh, in the end credits here a totally different vibe but a really cool one to listen to i like it a lot and i'm sitting here thinking like this is so different from the soundtrack why do i have literally no memory of this song whatsoever <laughs> nothing it sounds good it's a cool song uh i i dig that it is completely different vibe for the credit roll. But yeah, I wow, I don't remember this at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it is out there, but I think a good one to show the range and kind of put a cap on things. A couple tracks on the cutting room floor though. Uh let me get to a couple here. The first one is titled A Rock and a Hard Place. A Rock and a Hard Place is the title of the first chapter of the game, and so it would suggest that this is the music that plays in that chapter with the famous train hanging off the cliff sequence and all that, especially the cutscene that opens up the game where Nate realizes his peril. Later in the piece, past the clip, it's more of uh, what really fills out the piece and all with kind of more da 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 kind of like th this brass coming in and punctuating these hits and showing the the stakes and the drama of the moment. But I feel like this is one of the tracks, especially early on, that really brings up the Uncharted theme. And we haven't talked about the soundtrack to Uncharted Drake's Fortune, but there is a track there called Uncharted Theme. And it's this melody. Because those who have played the Uncharted games would know, oh, this is a famous melody, but what does it represent? I feel like it, if anything, it probably represents like the journey, uh, you know, the, the path that Nate has to take, the adventure theme, if anything, and how there are some, uh, some dangers ahead in that uncharted <laughs> overall series of events. But yeah, it's a really memorable leitmotif for the series as a whole. And while the rest of the piece for A Rock and a Hard Place with the train and all that gets into a different vibe, I feel like I needed to bring at least this to the show in some form. I'd like to report this song for false advertising. Nate is very much not between a rock and a hard place during this sequence. He is famously between a rock and nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll see you in court, Naughty Dog. Title your stuff. More accurately? I don't know. <laughs> I think they do a pretty good job when they talk about the next cutting room floor track, and this is The Monastery. So the monastery is the title of chapter 22 of like 25, 26 chapters, or no, it might be even 28. So like you're getting like pretty much close to the end of the game. And the monastery is like the last big building set piece in a way before you enter Shambhala. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty important uh, area. And you're kind of looking back on it. It's like, oh yeah, a lot of big gunfights here. Uh, snipers getting after you here in the monastery, but there is a beauty to this place again here in the Tibetan area. And that's kind of exemplified here in this part of the clip. 
gorgeous flute solo here played by Chris Bleff. He's who's credited as Woodwind Solos on the Uncharted 2 soundtrack. So uh, just beautiful music, uh, you know, mixing this flute in with the orchestra in a part of the game where, yeah, the clip will continue to have, you know, more action pieces to it as you're going through a lot of, uh, you know, intense combat at the monastery. But sit back, relax, and enjoy the beauty of the environment. Yeah, this is a very pretty piece. Uh, I always dig a flute solo. I feel like we don't get those nearly as often as we should. I say that with a lot of instruments, and I'm always right. Like, it's the flute, it's the banjo. Those are the only two I can think of off the top of my head, but that's more soundtracks need those, and this is a perfect example as to why for the flute, not the banjo. There's no banjo in this part. We'll always, you know, take more piano solos as well. That's also another thing. Yes, but that too. I think there's something with the flute and, you know, woodwind in general, where there's, like, actual breath behind it, and you can really tell the performative quality. And this is, of course, in a time where we're recording live performances, recording orchestras. We have the money and the technology to do that. And when you're hearing a live flute performance like this, like you're hearing the breath behind it, I think there's something extra special to that. So what will I never forget about Uncharted 2 Among Thieves? I think it's a game that going back to play it, I personally like Uncharted 3 more if I had to rank the original trilogy, but there is something special about Uncharted 2 and the step that it took for video games to be more cinematic and taking that that next level and putting Naughty Dog on the map and now one of my favorite developers in games. So uh, there is something special about this one and hearing just the music in this one uh, just also adds to that that gorgeous blend of telling stories and having gameplay and using the music to kind of blend those all together. I've said a couple of times now, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of this series, and I think I agree. Uh, and I was told at the time, like, if you don't like 2, the series probably isn't for you. But I am glad that it exists, if only for the soundtracks, because they're all really, really good. That is for sure. So let's transition to our next game. But before we do, we highlight a fan cover, a fan remix. Whether it's on YouTube, OC Remix, wherever it is on the internet. Found something from a YouTube channel called Fede Air Classic. And that's you know German. So W-D-R-K-L-A-S-S-I-K. So Fede Air Classic. I guess the Fede Air Funkhouse Orchestra is this group that uses this YouTube channel or to some extent, and they're a group based out of Germany. So they put up this piece. Uh, it's a small, you know, orchestra, you know, semi-pro. I, I, I don't know, honestly. And they played at the Cologne Philharmonic or the Kölner Philharmonie. And they played Reunion in a kind of medley with this and, and Nate's theme, I think, as well. Uh, but this take on Reunion is gorgeous, and it's played by a small orchestra that's based out of Germany. And I think that's so cool. So please enjoy that, and we'll be right back. All right, we're going to move from this big, grand adventure of falling out of trains, which, as far as I'm concerned, is all that Uncharted 2 is about, and <laughs> I'm only partially wrong, <laughs> and it's time to jump back into the way that Kangao hurts people like me every few years. We're going to talk about Finding Paradise. It is the sequel to To the Moon that came out in 2011. We talked about that game all the way back in episode 51, which I had forgotten it was that late into the show's life Yeah, that we waited to talk about To the Moon. I thought it was way earlier than that, but I guess I was wrong. Finding Paradise, originally released for PC on December 14th, 2017, and it was developed and published by Freebird Games. In this game, you are once more 
put in the shoes of Dr. Eva Roslin and Dr. Neil Watts, two scientists in the employ of Sigmund Corp. Sigmund Corp has technology that is capable of creating artificial memories in a patient that may conflict with their actual memories. And in order to prevent abuse of this technology, it is only legal to use it on patients who are actively on their deathbed with not long left to live. And so Sigmund offers this tech as a sort of wish fulfillment service, going into a dying patient's memory and implanting false memories of having achieved some goal or addressed some regret from earlier in their life. And it is just this service that Eva and Neil have been called to provide for their patient Colin Reeds, an ex-pilot. Upon entering Colin's latest memory and conversing with him, a rather complicated problem presents itself. Colin doesn't actually know what he wants, and he also does not want the doctors to change anything about his life. So they begin to work towards Colin's unusual request, gradually working their way through his memories in order to hopefully learn what his request even is, and if it's even possible to achieve it without altering his memories at all. Uh, once more, just like To the Moon, Finding Paradise was made in RPG Maker, which is an engine generally used to make turn-based RPGs, but Kangao used it to make adventure games. There's no combat or anything whatsoever. Well, mm. in this one, it's a little harder to say that. I yeah, guess. yeah. But for the most part, like, it does not play like an, like an RPG. It's more just walking around vignettes of Colin's memories and sort of piecing together events of his life. So, can the doctors figure out what Colin's desire actually is? Why is their trajectory through his memories so abnormal? And how does this mysterious childhood friend, Faye, factor into the whole thing. Peter, this is where I will ask, what are our experiences with Finding Paradise? I played Finding Paradise, well, before it, I played A Bird Story, which you'll get to talk about that, but uh, I played Bird Story and Finding Paradise, like, back-to-back -back, only a couple years ago, like, much later than I should have for how much I loved To the Moon. And maybe part of me was like, oh, could he really have captured that magic all over again? I think Finding Paradise is good, but I think To the Moon is better to the point where I'm having to check up uh, some refresher details on like, what were some of the end twists? Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. I do remember that. But it wasn't top of mind like To the Moon is. So I feel like that kind of says it all as far as my experience goes. Like, it's a good game. I really appreciated playing it. I'm glad I did. I'm looking forward to the sequel. But To the Moon is still, I think, top marks for that one. Yeah, To the Moon's still an all-timer. I agree. I like To the Moon better in general. But I do respect Kang Gao's... Uh, idea behind it where he was like, I'm not just trying to make to the moon again. I'm going to make something that's a bit of a different experience. And so the sort of tone and message behind Finding Paradise is a lot different from the tone of to the moon, where to the moon is actively attempting to do you emotional harm throughout the entire story. Uh, Finding Paradise still has some of those melancholy moments, but it's it feels a lot different in its execution. Uh, I really like it. I played it when it came out, like, launch day. I sat down and I played the whole thing in one go, which is probably what I'm going to do with the sequel. We'll see. But, yeah, I enjoy Finding Paradise, and honestly, I... This is going to sound blasphemous. I think I like the soundtrack of Finding Paradise slightly more than To the Moon. Mm, okay. Just ever so slightly more. Both of them are two of my favorite soundtracks ever, but I don't know. Something about Finding Paradise kicks it up a little bit. So, I was not actually able to find a whole hell of a lot 
about the development of Finding Paradise, all of the interviews with Kangao are either right after a bird story came out or in the past, like, three months leading up to Imposter Factory's release. Hmm. So none of them are about Finding Paradise. They're about Bird Story or they're about Imposter Factory, and those are the two you get, I guess. So, whatever. But we've mentioned a Bird Story a couple of times now, because the story of Finding Paradise actually begins in the short prologue game, A Bird Story, uh, which came out, I want to say... Two years before? There was a surprising gap, so yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it's that. Which is is very interesting, because uh, Kangao actually said he was pretty far into development on Finding Paradise when he decided to make a bird story, so that kind of hints at how long Finding Paradise was, was in development and all that. And they're connected. Do play those. Uh, yeah, a bird story came out in November 2014. So, yeah, so three years. A bird story follows the character who would later be revealed to be Colin through a daydream where he flies on a giant paper airplane with a bird that he has befriended. And uh, some implications point to that bird being a certain somebody, maybe. I don't know. It's it's left up to interpretation. Uh, and this game was released in 2014 and described as a prequel to, quote, To the Moon 2, because I don't think we had the title yet. I think the title drops at the end of A Bird Story, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes. So that was the first time we had heard that the game was going to be called Finding Paradise. And Kangao says, quote, I actually don't think it'd be possible to tell a bird story the way it was told in something like Finding Paradise. And that's why I decided to make it a separate game. I was actually a bit into the making of Finding Paradise when a bird story came about. It simply became something that I felt like I needed to make. And that's it. In terms of, I can find more on a bird story than I can find on Finding Paradise. So you could say that I did not find Paradise, but it's okay. Though I did find that uh, Finding Paradise was meant to release mid-2017, but personal issues in Kangao's life led to its delay in December of that year. Uh, Imposter Factory has had sort of the same trajectory, probably not helped even slightly by COVID. Because mm-hmm. uh, I believe this is the first one where he actually sort of has a team yeah. working on the game with him, which is really neat. I'm, I'm very interested to see how that sort of pans out. Because both this and To the Moon and Bird Story were all solo developed by Kang Gao. The game was reviewed pretty well upon release. Uh, it's got a Metacritic of about 81. A lot of praise given to the game's narrative and the game's soundtrack, much like To the Moon. There was actually a Switch release that was announced, I want to say like six months ago. <laughs> and it was originally slated for summer 2021. But it is September 28th. 2021 or later when you're hearing this and there's still no word on a release date for that but if i remember correctly uh the same exact thing happened with to the moon and it's coming to the switch and all that yeah that was during an indie world showcase that that dropped us Mm -hmm. like oh okay wow yeah it was just it was in the ending uh montage of and here's some more games that are coming out and i was like all right Brad, I kind of hope that means Imposter Factory ends up on Switch relatively quickly compared to To the Moon and Finding Paradise, which we keep saying that name. If you don't know what it is, Imposter Factory releases this week on Thursday, September 30th. It is the next game in the series, chapter question mark, question mark. Can Gal has implied that it is kind of a horror game? In certain ways, I'm really interested to see how that pans out. So you'll be hearing from me very soon about whether or not it was a, a goal or an airball. But I, I have trust in Kango. I think he and Freebird can pull it off. So for a minute, it seemed like we were just going to end up doing Kango again for the composer, because again, he wrote almost all of the music on the soundtrack outside of two songs, one of which isn't even in the game as far as you can tell. 
And we're going to talk about the person that did the song that's not in the game. Uh, his name is Chris Riker. He is apparently one of the two artists forming the group Riot X Riker, with Riot being the name of the drummer, specifically. I could find that Riot's first name is Scott, but that's literally all the information I could find. There's no... There's nothing. I don't have his last name or anything. He has an LP channel under the name Riot X Riker, but it's been two years since anything was uploaded to that channel. So I guess, no, he doesn't. Uh, but he does have a YouTube channel with two other people under the name Golden Boys. That's all one word. And they regularly upload covers, mostly of anime music. And they seem to do it once or twice a month. They're still going. Uh, the last one, when I checked during research, uh, was about two weeks ago, the last upload. So they're still still going strong on that one. And they're joined by somebody named Adam who serves as their producer and a fellow musician. And I can't really find anything else about it. They've got a Patreon that you can go check out if you want. That's over at patreon.com slash goldenboys, and that's legit all I can find. That's it. That's everything. And honestly, digging through this channel, I think this might be one of the few original songs they've ever made. The song is called Every Single Memory. I think, as far as I can tell, this is, like, one of the few original songs they've ever written, and it's assuredly the only one that is present on the game soundtrack. It seems to just be a bonus track. Because, yeah, it's on the soundtrack, but I've never heard that in-game. Yeah, I can't... I don't think it's in the game. Uh, I'm almost positive in saying that I don't think it's in the game. Because the whole soundtrack was done by Kangao, with Laura Shigihara once again providing a track just like she did with Everything's Alright, Into the Moon. And that's pretty much it. Maybe every single memory was used in marketing? I couldn't really tell. I think it might just be a bonus track uh, on the album. Anyways, it's time to talk about the Critical Five. I've blathered on enough. I want to get to this really, really great soundtrack. The first track on the Critical Five is Finding Paradise title theme. That's the good stuff. Kangao's music is always really neat, and it, it feels like a bit of a departure from a lot of To The Moon's soundtrack is piano. And this is still technically piano, I guess, but it, it has like almost this otherworldly feeling, mm -hmm. which is weird considering it's not. <laughs> it's the one that's not about going to space. But yeah, it just, it has this airy sort of feeling that I assume is supposed to reflect like Colin's a pilot. He's a retired airline pilot, etc., etc. And that's a really big part of his character. And it's a very important part of the plot. This song uh, gets to me. I feel like the piano synth, the da 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 the kind of instrument that's going in the background there, I feel like that's something I, I only hear in Kangao's music. <laughs> and it's... It's really nice and relaxing. It almost makes me think of like a dreamscape in a way, which I guess also fits uh, yeah. with, with Sigmund Corp's technology and all that. So I, I think that's something that really stands out, especially when hearing this and, you know, this is kind of like the big swell of the piece. It kind of starts a little slower, but uh, this is just, yeah, a really nice theme. You got to get the main theme in there. Right. And uh, Ken Gao always does great work with this kind of theme in particular, but also the rest of the soundtrack. 
And honestly, the, the sort of airy, dreamy feel might also be meant to reflect the fact that Colin, in his younger years, was kind of a space case. Mm, yes. Uh, and that's a very, very important part of his plot. He daydreamed all, I mean, a bird story is all about one of his daydreams. So it, it fits very well. Following that is critical check number two, Time is a Place. Just remember, everybody, Asgard is not a place, it's a people. Um, but time is a place, apparently. There are a bunch of versions of this song on the soundtrack. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's like a song that he is learning to play with an orchestra in his life, like in-game. Hmm. Uh, because there's also this, and there's also a piece just called The Scale Song, which is what plays whenever any of them, like, get on an instrument because colin i believe plays cello it sounds about right his wife also might play cello i don't remember she plays another string instrument though because he meets her through being part of this this orchestra and this is just a very very pretty piece and the fact that it's on the soundtrack in like 10 different iterations i should probably put it on the critical five it's just beautiful i think can has a really apt way of creating melody and supporting it with the right instruments and it's just it makes you feel good to listen to uh you know really hopeful in this way and yeah when yeah talking about dreams and what you're aspiring to be and involving orchestras and things like that it's uh it's gorgeous also involves later in the clip a main theme that we'll play and um, you'll talk about very shortly Mm-hmm. in fact let's talk about it now, with Critical Track number three, Phase Theme. Faye is Colin's childhood friend, a friend that he had pretty much up till, I want to say, high school, maybe college? Uh, I don't exactly remember where the cutoff on that is, but she's a very, very important character in his story, uh, and she's also probably the most important character in Finding Paradise. I really like how they sort of do... Uh, spoilers for a game that came out like four years ago. Really like the the fake out where they try and make it seem like they're doing River again. Mm. And then it turns out, oh, that's not at all what's happening here. You'll just have to figure out what that actually is, though. <laughs> yeah, it's I recommend playing it to find out because I think it's a really good twist at the end. I think it's fantastically done. But yeah, Faye is just this super important character, and her piece is basically, like you said, it's it's essentially the main theme of the game. It's the leitmotif that shows up all over the soundtrack. This isn't my favorite version of Faye's theme. We'll actually get to my favorite down in the uh, cutting room floor. But for now, yeah, it this is one of the most important songs in the game, and it needed to be here. Absolutely. Uh, I think this clip also shows that like Kango also likes his wind chimes to go into the swells like it's a big kind of big uh, thing that he uses for sure and it's like uh, if you're listening to a piece of his it's probably has that but also yeah these like little I don't know, it's like almost like harp plucking or like as like a guitar like some plucked string that really is that play here you're absolutely right a, a light motif that is 
necessary to discuss when talking about the game and a character uh, to fit as well. Following that, it's my favorite non-vocal piece on this soundtrack. I love this song. Critical track number four is The Fiction We Tell Ourselves. This song plays during the climax of the game, where Colin is about to die. He is very close to dying, and Neil sort of has this epiphany of, I know what he wants, I know what he wants, and I know how we can get it to him. And he does this really unorthodox thing. It's a moment I think about a lot when it comes to this soundtrack. Uh, and also the, the title is named after a quote that he says where he, he refers to memories as the fiction we tell ourselves, which is kind of true. Human memory is bad and dumb and, uh, we don't really remember things one to one ever. The combination of this song, Neil and Eva's theme also have a few appearances in this piece as well. Just the whole thing comes together with the sequence around it so, so well. I really like this song. Just another case of game music where it's just like, oh, it sounds great on its own, and it sounds really nice, but you put it with the right narrative beat, the right things happening on screen, and it takes it to a whole other level. So definitely check out Finding Paradise to hear this in that proper context. And it, it feels like that's just something that doesn't happen with other mediums very often. Mm -hmm. So it's fantastic. But let's get to the main event. This is the reason for the season, as it were. Let's talk about critical track number five. Wish my life away. Trading my yesterday hey, is to wish my life away. This is the one. This is the song. The biggest emotional climax in the game. Of course, this song done by Laura Shigihara. She both composed it and that is her voice that you hear. I believe that is also her playing piano. Oh, man, Laura Shigihara is so good. <laughs> oh, I, I love her stuff so much. Um, I think I personally prefer Everything's Alright as a song, but this song is still really, really good. And just, once again, the lyrics match up perfectly with just everything that's happening on screen. It's got this emotional gut punch, but this time in a very, very different way than like something like Everything's Alright was going to give you. I don't know. This, uh, this song means a good deal to me, just like Everything's Alright, just in general. If Flora Shigihara is not contributing to Imposter Factory, it's going to be a real shame because like Everything's Alright Into the Moon... You're right, this is the standout musical moment of the game, and for good reason. It's just a really heartfelt, gorgeous piece. And man, I wish I could have put the opening part of the verse, like that's something that also stands out to me. Because like when you hear her start to sing in the game, it's like, oh, this is this is the moment. <laughs> we're we're getting another Laura Shigihara song. But then also like the the kind of lead up into the chorus. I, I wish I could put the whole piece in here, honestly. And it, if anything, you know, okay, yeah, the chorus is lovely and wonderful, but 
there's so much more to this piece than just that. So do please listen to the whole thing. It's worth it. And then even so, in game, even better. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because then you get to like witness firsthand like, oh, that's why the lyrics are this. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so good. I can feel tears in my eyes, so we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have crying on podcasts. There's no crying in baseball or podcasts. So, for tracks on the cutting room floor, I got a couple I want to bring. The uh, first one isn't so much because I like it. I mean, I do like it, but it's more here because... It's different. <laughs> yeah, this sure is a song and a moment that happens in the game. My track on the cutting room floor is Power Overwhelming. such a weird moment (laughs) yeah we're going full jrpg (laughs) this is why it's it feels a little weird to say yeah there's no combat in this one because this time happens at a moment where for some reason it just becomes a video game we're gonna be final fantasy now (laughs) it's it's absolutely bizarre i think that section is hilarious i think it goes for a little longer than it has to but It's a very, very memorable part of the game. And if I remember correctly, isn't a magical girl transformation involved somewhere in this sequence too? Probably. It wouldn't (laughs) surprise me. Yeah, it's definitely a big shift for sure. But yeah, uh, played well. I think I may even had some difficulty with it because I'm like, I'm just not ready for this, honestly. I think uh, the exact same thing happened to me. It's, It's such a weird departure. But it is totally in character for Neil Watts, so let's just, you know, it works. And a very fitting title of Power Overwhelming. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure that not only a Magical Girl thing, I'm pretty sure he also goes Super Saiyan in some form. There's a lot of stuff like that. It's awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like, oh, you're talking like this Dragon Ball? Yeah, 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 for sure. (laughs) And my other track on the cutting room floor is a different version of a song from the Critical Five. My personal favorite version. It is phase theme, piano version. This song plays right after Wish My Life Away. And if Wish My Life Away didn't get you, this is gonna get you. (laughs) Because it just involves a balcony and a talk. And I don't want to give any more away about that. I feel like I can't talk about why this, like, is a direct assault on my emotions without spoiling some stuff. So I'll just leave it at that. This moment probably stuck with me harder than any other moment in the game. Yeah. Wow. I mean, taking that phase theme leitmotif and putting it to piano, you're definitely turning up the emotions on that one. And we sure love our pianos. Uh, So this definitely, I think, deserves to be here, even if on the cutting room floor. And it's also like at a slower tempo Mm -hmm, and oh it's just so well put together so what will i never forget about finding paradise obviously it is not as sad as to the moon where to the moon was a game that looked you in the eyes and was like you're going to cry i don't care if you want to or not you're going to cry finding paradise doesn't really set out with that mission per se but it does have this sort of melancholy tone to it the whole way through and going back into thinking about games like to the moon and finding paradise uh, especially right now uh, in my life it's very weird 
to have this different context to this kind of story. And I think that, while again, I, I agree that To the Moon is a better game, Finding Paradise is not a game that you should skip. Oh, oh absolutely not. And a bird story as well. You should, you should play a bird story uh, before you play Finding Paradise. But it's not so much an emotional gut punch as it is an emotional flick on the forehead if that makes sense. And it works with that sort of vibe perfectly. I am so excited for Imposter Factory. I trust Kangal with my life currently because he has yet to miss, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, Kangal can do whatever he wants. And even though like I had to be reminded of things about Finding Paradise, like looking back on it, it's like, oh yeah, that was that was definitely a thing that is powerful and I'm glad we finally got to bring songs like Wish My Life Away to the show because, yeah, they're uh, they're important as far as like our video game experiences. And hopefully we get to pass these on to you so that you can experience them as well. Well, I don't know how we transition out of that because <laughs> Finding Paradise is kind of a huh, an emotional downer, a kind of like a heavy sort of a game to process, I think. And then you get Uncharted and it's Pulp Adventure, where they're also <laughs> trying to find the paradise of Shangri-La and Shambhala. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's that's what ties these together. But also, you know, as always, great soundtracks on this show for Uncharted 2 Among Thieves and Finding Paradise. So that will do it this week for us on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at String Pixel. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. That's where Joe's other podcast, Masterpieces, is hosted, where we have a couple more weeks until we figure out what the last character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is. Oh, it's going to be an interesting time, so catch up on Smasherpieces. And also listen to Original Sound Chat. Get those wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even on Spotify, where we have a feed for podcast episodes for Original Sound Chat. But we also have a Spotify playlist, where if we cover a song from a game on this show, and it's on Spotify, it's getting added to that big monster playlist. Joe, what's being added this week? Both. Uh, once more, like I said a couple weeks ago, or it might have even been last week, I don't remember, To the Moon and Finding Paradise just sort of showed up on Spotify. And I didn't know until, on a whim, I went and looked up to see if Finding Paradise was on Spotify. So, it's there. And of course, I believe all of the Uncharted soundtracks are on Spotify. So, yeah, we got a, a, a wealth of new additions coming up. All right, good music to add there. When you're done listening, you can find us on social media for the show at SoundChat OST. Leave some feedback for us on how we're doing with these episodes. Also, suggestions for games you'd like us to cover in the future, because that's one of our big goals for 2021 is figuring out and adding more of those to the weeks ahead. Joe, who are we talking about next week? Well, next week we get to start my annual themed month, Spooks. Yeah, it's spooks time, baby! And I'll be talking about Tetsuya Kawauchi. I will be talking about Sakae Osumi. I don't know much about that soundtrack, so I'm looking forward to learning along with all of you. Hey, that's the same with mine. Woo! Fun. It should be a good episode to start October. All right, to play us out, Joe, take it away. Obviously, I had to find a cover of Wish My Life Away. Like, that's the one. I'm sure there are covers of, like, Phase Theme and all that, but Wish My Life Away is the one you gotta look for, and I did find one by YouTuber OD, that's O-D-I-I, and this also features Jemmy Chen on guitar, and it's just her singing Wish My Life Away with an acoustic version, and it's really, really, really good, so please enjoy that. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care.